Hello everybody and welcome to our Facebook Live question and answer for the month. I'm Dr. Rami Caldas of the Caldas Center and we are looking forward to answering your questions today. March is Endometriosis Awareness Month so we will be chatting a lot about endo tonight but please feel free to ask whatever questions you want concerning health, endo or otherwise, I'd be glad to answer. So we are here to help you and try to achieve a great life for you. Thank you everyone who submitted questions on Facebook already. If you have not sent in your question, feel free to post it to Facebook Live and we will do our best to answer it tonight. If, we would, if, if you would like to submit a question anonymously, please contact us using Facebook Messenger and indicate that you'd like to share the question and remain anonymous because we want everyone to feel comfortable and have a good time as we chat tonight. Before we, we begin, a reminder that this question and answer is meant to be informational only. If you have serious health concerns, make certain to contact your physician. If you'd like to contact the Calda Center, visit caldacenter.com or call us at 920-886-2299 during normal business hours. And remember, you never need a referral to come to the Calda Center from your primary care doc because we are obstetrician gynecologists and we're also classified as primary care doctors therefore even though we do a lot of fancy surgery by law you never need a referral all you need is to pick up the phone and a desire to feel better so let's get started from larissa what causes endometriosis where does it come from exactly that's a great question uh, larissa so Endometriosis is ectopic or, or endometrium. The endometrium is the lining of the uterus that is growing outside the uterus, but it's not a cancer, okay? Rarely there can be a cancer in it, but not, not usually. And, um, and so it comes, we think most of the time, from what's called retrograde menstruation. So when a woman has her period, 100% of women, we think, have retrograde menstruation where the menstrual blood goes backwards through the tubes and not only out and it, then it goes through the tubes into the pelvis and the surrounding tissues and all over the place in the abdomen and about 10 to 15 percent the immune system does not clear it out and those people end up with endometriosis implants now fundamentally therefore we think endometriosis is an immune deficiency and therefore, people with endometriosis have other immune disease, immune mediated diseases like hypothyroidism or rheumatoid arthritis. And so fundamentally, endometriosis is an immune deficiency disease that results in these painful implants and reductions in fertility because of those implants. Okay? And, and so it's also a neurologic disease. Because we know that people who have painful endometriosis have three times the neurotransmitter that transmits pain to part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex where pain is perceived. And so it is not only an autoimmune deficiency, it is a neurologic abnormality in addition. But it's not in someone's head, it's real and it can hurt real bad. So thank you Larissa for that question from Maria tonight. Does diet play a role in endometriosis? I have seen so much out there about cutting out what seems like everything, specifically red meats, dairy, sugar, to reduce inflammation, which supposedly reduces endometriosis or the symptoms of it. Thanks, thank you, Maria. Hey, diet can play a role because different people react differently. Once again, that immune response. You know, many diseases are immune mediated. So like lupus or psoriasis where the immune system is attacking your skin or uh, multiple sclerosis we think is immune mediated. So anything that causes your particular immune system to get too excited and then it starts, you know, eating, eating itself, you know, attacking your own body then that, that, can, that can make endometriosis worse. And so for some people, that's lactose because they have a lactose allergy. And then certainly carbohydrates can cause inflammation 
and indeed atherosclerosis is thought to be somewhat immune mediated and the, the, you know, the deposits happen in the vessels and the heart and there's an inflammation and damage associated with that to the vessels ending, uh, you know, leading to um, you know, uh, myocardial infarction or ischemia or, or angina. And so in, once again, it's that immune mediation and so any little bit helps, including diet. Uh, is that going to be a make or break type of thing? For most people, no. But if, if it can improve the symptoms somewhat of endometriosis, if you are strict with your diet and have a lot of turmeric, for example, uh, uh, an anti-inflammation type of uh, um, uh, diet, uh, including turmeric, and minimize those carbohydrates, those processed car carbohydrates and dairy, I think that uh, life will be better. And in general, you'll feel better too, not, not only on the endometriosis front. Thanks, Maria. Hey, and then from Jackie, does Oralissa work? Does it treat or cure endometriosis? Thank you, Jackie. Oralissa does work for symptoms of endometriosis. It does treat it. It does not cure it. And so Oralissa is a GMRH antagonist. So a, gonadot a gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist. So essentially what it does is it turns off the ovaries, it down regulates them. And it comes in two doses, 150 or 200. And with the 150, you can be on it a little bit longer. Whereas with the 200, a little bit shorter because the higher dose, it, you can't, you sh it'll cause osteoporosis similar to the Lupron. However, the lower dose of Oralissa doesn't seem to have as many side effects, but you can't be on it for more than a couple of years for the same reasons, because you'll get, end up with osteoporosis and menopausal type ailments. And therefore, and then you go off of it and then endometriosis implants can get all, all excited again and, and the endometriosis continues to progress. However, it does treat the symptoms of it and it is a reasonable uh, choice and might be the right choice for some people with endometriosis, especially after excisional therapy, for example. Uh, that will pre you know, prevent recurrence of disease longer. It, it is more uh, useful if you have a surgeon who doesn't do excisional therapy and they just burn it because the burning doesn't really get rid of the disease. It doesn't, and, and so you end up with you know, more symptoms, residual symptoms, if it's suboptimally you know, excised. Excisional therapy is most important. Prevention of recurrence of a, or, or prevention of periods after that is the best way to treat endometriosis and keep the symptoms away, and Oralissa can play a role. Thank you, Jackie. Hey, just a reminder, if you'd like to set up a time to speak with us at the Calda Center, you can call us at 920-886-2299 or go to caldacenter.com, and I want you to remember and tell all your friends to see your OBGYN, you never need a referral, and therefore you do not need a referral to come to the Calda Center to be evaluated for your endometriosis or incontinence or anything else for that matter, uh, your primary care doctor simply does not need to refer you. You just have to have a wish to feel better. Do I need a referral to see you at the Calva Center? Why is that? No, you don't need a referral as I was saying, and state and federal law protects your access to your primary care doctor. Some insurance companies may request that. However, that's they're on thin ice then, because state and federal law says you don't need a referral to go see your pediatricians, your obstetrician gynecologist, and your family doctors. Therefore, we welcome anyone who wants to give us a call and don't let anyone tell you otherwise because you just don't need a referral to come to the Calva Center and be seen for, you know, and, and treated so you can get back and enjoy a full life without discomfort and achieve your goals of pregnancy if that's the challenges you're having. Hey, from Heidi we have, have you dealt with luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome, or LUFS it's called? What is your treatment process for LUF and the success rate? Oh boy, LUFS is a, a hard one to even diagnose, Heidi. And so this is when you actually have a follicle that does not ovulate but luteinizes. So on the ultrasound, let's say, sure looks like you ovulated, 
and your progesterone you know goes up and you end up having a period on time and everything but you did not be late okay and so this is this is a, a challenging thing to treat but the treatment ultimately is a trigger shot and so that's going to be with uh, something that mim mimics luteinizing hormone in a high dose is the best treatment obviously if that is not working and which is really hard to tell okay um, uh, other than you're simply not getting pregnant uh, and, and then uh, you know IVF will get around that because with IVF you go into the egg or into the follicle to retrieve the egg therefore you don't need to have ovulation or rupture of the ovulatory follicle which is ovulation but a trigger shot with something like uh, Albedrel or Pregnil is the way to go to treat uh, because that should give you the best chance of ov ovulation with the luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome. A rare condition thought to represent less than 5% of people uh, who are having challenges getting pregnant. Thanks for that interesting question, Heidi. Hey, and Erica writes, many women have shared pictures of their endo scars on Instagram. If I need endometriosis surgery, will there be lots of scarring? Good grief, Erica, no. And so, and so it may occur, but the, the key with is meticulous surgical technique, okay? We already know that people with endometriosis have an overactive immune system to these uh, implants and they're not clearing them. But if there is no bleeding and there is no char, then there will be minimal scarring. So this is why my preference, as it has been for the last 27 years, is to use the carbon dioxide laser to excise, to remove the endometriosis, because then you seal the vessels as you go along up to three millimeters. Of course, if you see a larger vessel bleeding right into the endometriotic implant, then you go ahead and take care of it, I mean, uh, before you get into a bloody mess. And then you minimize bleeding and you minimize the char associated with it. The carbon dioxide laser has a collateral damage, meaning the tissue around it that's damaged is only 0.1 to 0.2. That's 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. Therefore, because of the minimal tissue damage and because laparoscopic surgery, you know, the belly stays closed and it, it isn't exposed to the air, there's not a drying effect. And therefore, there is a minimal scarring. On the other hand, if someone goes in there and burns around all over and buzzes here, buzzes there, burns all over the place, you're gonna have plenty of scarring and it's gonna probably hurt more after a few months. So thanks for that question about scar tissue and endometriosis surgery. So a reminder, if you want a time to speak with the Caldas Center, you can just call us. You don't need a referral. 886 2299 920 2299 or visit caldascenter.com and uh, feel free to keep asking questions, absolutely. And so, from Brittany, hey, is there a link between polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis? You know, that is a great question. And, I, and many people have hypothesized it and the articles have gone both ways. But in my experience, I think that there's a link. I think that I have seen a higher percentage of people in, um, uh, with polycystic ovaries who have had endometriosis, uh, that is, but that's anecdotal. I have not done a complete study on the thousands of people that I've had who have endometriosis and don't have polycystic ovaries and who have polycystic ovaries and who don't have endometriosis and the ones who have both, but just observationally over the last 27 years, I suspect that there may be a link there. Either way, I'm gonna treat both of them and very frequently my patients have both of them and we treat both of them so they can achieve their goals and feel better and you know, uh, achieve, uh, you know, and achieve pregnancy and, and uh, lose weight and all that, uh, all those things that make life you know, better for people. And so thank you, Brittany, for that question. So from Melissa, is it normal to have more than one surgery to remove endometriosis? That is a good question, Melissa, because most surgeons do not do excisional therapy. It's estimated that less than 1% of surgeons do excisional therapy. And so I've had lots and lots of patients come in who've already had a surgery 
and they're told, oh, we didn't do anything because you'd end up with a colostomy, or we didn't do anything because the is too dangerous, your ureter would have been injured. And, and those surgeons are correct because in, in, in most people's hands, taking endometriosis off the bowel and around the bowel, away from the bowel and around the ureter is just not a good idea because the, the people who have been trained to do that are so few and far between. And, and so it ends up that people end up having multiple surgeries. However, if you have a very good excisional therapy in skilled hands, then your surgical interventions are gonna be minimized. There is about a 50% chance recurrence of endometriosis. However, if you prevent menses from happening, you can really uh, slow that down and, uh, and slow the recurrences down. And so we will be here until 8 p.m. tonight. Keep those questions coming. So, so I would say that um, with the endometriosis uh, surgery, you just want to do your homework because obstetrics and gynecology training is very broad. And these days, most of it is geared towards obstetrics. But to learn how to deliver a baby, no matter how skillfully, does not qualify someone to uh, you know, do, uh, uh, be very proactive and, 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 and do excisional therapy of deep endometriosis uh, because they, uh, that, that could lead to serious damage in people. And, you, and, and I'm, never, I'm, I'm never upset when a surgeon, an OBGYN, says to someone, well, I didn't do anything because it would have been too dangerous because they're right. If they thought it was too dangerous in their hands, it is too dangerous in their hands. Then, then you know, hopefully the patient finds the Calda Center or another of the 50 uh, you know, places in the country uh, that, are, uh, that are recommended to actually do this kind of surgery without getting into a bloody mess and without causing a bunch of scarring and without having colostomies occur and without uh, you know, doing unnecessarily uh, fertility robbing surgeries. Uh, and so, so, but that is a long answer to the question. And that is why you hear about people having uh, you know, multiple surgeries because their goals are not achieved with the first one. It does make me a little bit sad. I, I, I do wish that people would find this sooner frequently so they wouldn't have to have multiple surgeries. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, this is the, the nature of life. So, from Courtney, why does endometriosis prevent people from getting pregnant? So, that is a very good question, Courtney. Courtney, so what happens is there is a multi-pronged thing. So, endometriosis will cause inflammation in the pelvis and the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then the egg and the sperm have to deal in this environment with an overabundance of immune cells. And you have to remember the sperm, each one is a single cell, and the egg is a single cell. And they can, are susceptible to being attacked by the immune system in this free-for-all that's going on in the pelvis for people with endometriosis. And so that's one way. And endometriosis can cause a lot of scarring too. And so it can scar the tubes shut. It can damage the tubes internally, where the, the little hairs inside the tube don't move the egg and the sperm together very well. It can cause something called salpingitis isthmica nodosa, where the tube where it goes into the uterus, right where it goes into the uterus has become inflamed and it becomes like a stovepipe and it doesn't work very well and it's narrower. And that's particularly bad if someone has adenomyosis around the tubes. So adenomyosis is endometriosis of the wall of the uterus. And if that happens around the tubes, then those tubes are not very functional. And, it, and if you do get pregnant, you're gonna have a higher chance uh, with that of, of having ectopic pregnancy. In addition, the most obvious thing, endometriosis for a lot of people is very painful. And it causes a lot of pain when you try to have sex. And so who wants to have sex if it's hurting? It's like, you know, if someone puts their hand on a stove and it gets burned and they say, ouch, well, they're not gonna put their hand on the stove again and sex is gonna be no fun. And if you're not having sex, you're not getting pregnant unless you're getting help from someone. So anyway, thank you for that question. Okay, from Tiffany. Looking at pictures of endometriosis, the spots are so small. How can something this small cause such a problem with getting pregnant and we we were just touching on that even though the spots are so small the the, the pathophysiology the the 
molecular environment going on in there is like bad fireworks, like way too many fireworks. And it's like, uh, it just, it, it doesn't work because of the infl inflammation that's going on, even though those spots are small, even if they don't cause those, those tubes to scar shut. And so it is abundantly clear that it reduces fertility by about 50%. And a lot of people will say, including you know my uh, my teacher uh, Cameron Najat, who invented video laparoscopy and was the first one to connect a laser to it uh, back in the late '80s. Um, and uh, he he like many others, if you have gone through fertility therapy and it is not working for two years, as especially uh, you know if you're over 35, but also even if you're in your 20s, it, it is endometriosis until proven otherwise. And once it's treated, all other things being equal and normal, you've got an 80% chance of being pregnant within the following year. That is abundantly and widely reported. So thank you for that question. From Tashanda, how can I get my sex drive back after surgery? Oh boy. Well, we were just touching on the fact that people with endometriosis you know, even though 25% of them are asymptomatic and they just present because they can't get pregnant, but they just don't have any real bad symptoms. Um, but a lot of them are having a lot of pain with, their, with, with intercourse before they get it treated. And then even after that's gone, it's not like the body's like, okay, I'm normal, it's all good. And there's still that subconscious lack of the sex drive. And so you, you, it, we can treat this through counseling. We can treat this through um, using some testosterone uh, to elevate your testosterone levels by either orally or with cream or with pellets. And that will lift the sex drive so you have an interest then. And then it's then through re re you know, re recurrent positive experiences that are pleasant for someone that you will then have greater libido. But once you know, it takes having positive experiences after getting rid of the disease to get there. Obviously, if you've had surgery, like that was, you know, like took your ovaries out or something like that, and you're menopausal now, well, that's a whole different bag of worms altogether because you've just, you know, deprived, you've been deprived of your estrogen and that will affect your libido significantly also. It really helps to have a partner or husband who is on board and understanding with the situation because they can participate with, you know, be patient and, and, and have fun with the foreplay and help you, you know, get that sex drive back once you get uh, taken care of uh, with excisional therapy. Great question. So there's an anonymous question. Is there a test for endometriosis? Do teens ever get endometriosis? Oh boy, do they ever. And so uh, the test for endometriosis is laparoscopic surgery, okay? Laparoscopic surgery is the only way to definitively diagnose endometriosis. But I'll tell you, on pelvic exam, and I don't normally do pelvic exams on someone any younger than 17 or 18 years old, uh, but uh, who's not sexually uh, active, but on pelvic exam, if you know what you're looking for and the disease is like significant, because the most common site for the disease is in the cul-de-sac behind the uterus, and you can feel that on pelvic exam. You can feel it. So if you have large pustules or nodules of endometriosis, your endometriosis specialist will be able to feel it. And I, I'm very specific in this, not, not to be too, uh, you know, uh, adamant about it, but your endometriosis specialist. I almost uniformly, of the thousands and thousands of patients I have seen who have come in here, and I feel the endometriosis behind their uterus, I ask every one of them, every one of the thousands, and I think one person in the last 27 years has said that their prior physician or physicians ever even felt back there. I'm not sure what they're doing on exam, but they're not feeling for endometriosis. And so you can feel it 
back there frequently, not all the time, the only definitive way to diagnose it is through laparoscopy. In addition, if a first degree relative like your mom has endometriosis to your older sister, you've got about seven times the likelihood of having it. And so that in and of itself should tip you off. If you're having like killer periods and you're you know, curled up on the bathroom floor as a, as a 15 or a 16 year old and your mom ha has a history of endometriosis, well, duh, I think someone needs to put their thinking cap on and go looking for that and then treat it appropriately. And it, and it can be treated effectively and minimally invasively, frequently without surgery in teenagers, okay? So just a reminder, if you would like to set up a time to speak with the Calva Center, you can call us at 920-886-2299 or visit calvacenter.com. No referrals are needed. It's just a, a, a desire to feel better. Okay, from Charlotte. Does endo put me at risk for other illnesses or conditions? Yeah, it sure does, Charlotte, because it's the autoimmune thing. So, you've got <clears throat> seven times the likelihood of having thyroid disease. So, low thyroid, because that's also immune-mediated, like Hashimoto's thyroiditis and stuff. Number two, you've got five times the risk of getting rheumatoid arthritis. You're going to have twice the risk of having multiple sclerosis sometime in your life, which is still a very low risk, but it's twice the baseline rate for, for women. You've gotta be thinking about other things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and things like, any immune-mediated disease is going to be more likely in someone with endometriosis because fundamentally, endometriosis is an immune-mediated disease. So an autoimmune disease. Thanks for that question, Charlotte. So I don't want you thinking you're gonna get, um, you know, multiple sclerosis though, that's very unlikely. But if you're dragging around, well, number one, you're probably terribly fatigued because you're in pain so much and uh, that, that, that in and of itself is depressing. But number two, you, you wanna check your thyroid out, of course, not just the TSH, T3 and T4 also. Check for those antibodies, okay? Thanks for the question, Charlotte. Melissa, I had stage three endometriosis removed by you a little over two years ago, but my tubes were clear at that time. I have an HSD, HSG this next Tuesday. What are the chances that the endometriosis came back and have blocked my fallopian tubes now? Oh my gosh, life is dynamic, Melissa, and I sure hope they're not blocked and I don't think they're going to be blocked because my observation is that when the disease, like I'll find it in different people in different places, some people, will have it only on the bladder. Some people will have it only behind the uterus. Some people will have it all over the fallopian tubes. So I'm predicting if your endometriosis has come back, which I certainly hope not that quickly after two years, um, uh, but if it wasn't on the tubes before, I don't think it's going to be on the tubes now, and I think your tubes are gonna be open, okay? So I'm looking forward to giving you some good news. Thanks for the question, Melissa. All right. It looks like we're already out of time tonight. Oh my goodness. Thanks everyone for joining the conversation. If you did not get your question in, we'll follow up with you in the next few days. A reminder that if you'd like to speak further with us, visit the calvacenter.com or give us, uh, give our office a call at 920-886-2299. And no referrals are needed from your primary care doctor otherwise, because we are recognized as primary care doctors as certified obstetrician gynecologist. So you don't need a referral. As for tonight, thank you again for spending the time with us and we hope you have a wonderful evening watching basketball.